Hello marine biology students. In this video we're going to talk about lophophorates and echinoderms. So this next group of animals we're going to talk about actually encompass three phyla, but what unites them is their feeding structure. A lophophore is a distinctive ciliated feeding structure and often it is horseshoe shaped. There are three animal phyla, which all have this feature. Now these phyla were far more common in the geologic past in that they make up a disproportionately large portion of the fossil record compared to their modern day abundances. The first of these lophophorates are the bryozoans. Phylum Bryozoa. Their name literally translates into moss animals because these colonies look very moss-like. All bryozoans are colonial and form small colonies. Some are encrusting, others form small fan-shaped or tree-shaped colonies. They are found in certain marine environments nowadays, but in the past, there are entire fossil beds that are simply bryzoan fossils, and they can be key indicator species for identifying which time period a fossil bed came from. They are suspension feeders, and there are about 6,000 species, again, most of them in the oceans. The two other phyla for lophophorates include the pharaonids, phylum pharaonida, And the pharaonids, they are tube worms with this specialized lophophore feeding appendage. So they are very worm-like. And their tube is usually made out of sand grains. They have a circular or horseshoe-shaped lophophore. And there are 32 recognized species, all marine and in shallow water. And the last group of lophophorates are the brachiopods, or lamp shells. Brachiopods have two shells that enclose their body, and so you might think that they are mollusks or bivalves, but because of this lophophore, we know that they are different. They're similar in appearance to bivalves. but their external anatomy is very different. While there are 400 living species of brachiopods, there are thousands of different fossil species that are known. Again, they used to make up a very significant portion of the marine invertebrates in the areas they were found in. The next phylum we're gonna discuss is phylum Echinodermata. Their name literally means spiny skin. One interesting aspect of echinoderms is that they have pentamerous radial symmetry. Meaning they are often star-shaped or they have five units of symmetry around their center in adults, but bilaterally symmetrical larva. All echinoderms have a water vascular system which is a series of tubes that they can use to send water from one area to another, and they control tube feet, which the echinoderms use for moving and feeding. Echinoderms use their skin for respiration. And unlike some of the organisms that we've talked about recently, their nervous system is decentralized. Their brain is absent. Even though echinoderms have spiny skin, they have an endoskeleton. Meaning that their skeleton is going to be surrounded by skin and soft tissue. 
Echinoderms have amazing regenerative ability, and they can easily replace lost body parts, and sometimes the lost body parts replace the missing portion of the organism. All 7,000 species of echinoderms are exclusively marine. So let's talk about these different groups of echinoderms. The first are the sea stars, class Asteroidea. These sea stars move around using their tube feet. They have a central disc in the center of their body. Surrounded by five arms, or multiples of five, and the internal organs of the sea star will spread not only through the central disc, but also into their arms. Their skeleton is usually composed of calcium carbonate plates. which are loosely embedded in the spiny skin, making them slightly flexible. Sea stars have a structure on their surface that prevents other organisms from attempting to grow on top of them. They are little pinchers called pedicillaria. And they help keep the surface of the organism clean. Maybe surprisingly, sea stars are carnivores. They feed on a diversity of invertebrates in the environments they're found in. Here we see a diagram of a typical sea star. It has a oral and aboral surface, or the surface that contains the mouth and the surface that is opposite the mouth. And we can see the internal structures are continuous within the legs of the individuals. Our next type of echinoderm are the brittle stars, the ophiroids, class Ophiroida. What distinguishes brittle stars from the other sea stars is that they have very thin, flexible legs. Their internal organs are all restricted to the central disc and do not extend into the legs themselves. Brittle stars also have tube feet without suckers, which they use for feeding on detritus and small animals. Brittle stars are not the predators that their sea star brethren are. Surprisingly, even though sea stars have a complete digestive system, brittle stars do not. They instead have a gastrovascular cavity. Which has a single opening that serves as both a mouth and an anus. Our next group of echinoderms are from class Echinoidea. which are the clearest examples of how echinoderms got their name. These are the sea urchins with long, conspicuous, movable spines. For the sea urchins and sand dollars, their calcium carbonate plates fuse into a solid test or shell. They move using their tube feet. with their mouth oriented on the bottom of the organism and the anus on the surface, or aboral top side. Urchins have a specialized mouth called Aristotle's lantern. It is a feeding structure composed of jaws and muscles that allow these urchins to feed on seaweeds. detritus, and encrusting organisms that they scrape off of surfaces. So here we can see both a sea urchin and a sand dollar, which is simply a modified flattened urchin with less obvious spines. Here we can see the feeding structure known as Aristotle's lantern and a few different types of urchin body shapes. Our next group of echinoderms are the sea cucumbers, class Holothuroidea.
They appear worm-like, with the mouth and an anus on opposite ends, and five rows of tube feet restricted to one side. However, they do still have their pentamerous radial symmetry, even if superficially they appear to have bilateral symmetry. Their skin can be embedded with calcareous spicules, but they do not have spines, and for the most part, they feel soft to the touch. They are deposit feeders. with most species obtaining their organic matter from ingested sediment. Sea cucumbers are known for a unique defense mechanism known as evisceration. In which, when threatened, they expel their internal respiratory organs, often ensnaring and definitely confusing the predator. These internal organs can end up being regenerated and replaced. The last class of echinoderms we'll talk about are the crinoids, class Crinoidea. Crinoids usually have five or more arms that branch out for suspension feeding. Some crinoids are stationary as adults and they are attached to a stalk settled on the bottom. This is true for most deep water crinoid species. However, there are some free-living and swimming crinoids as well that inhabit coral reefs. So sea lilies live attached in deep water, yet feather stars crawl on the bottom and live mostly in shallow water coral reefs. Crinoids are another example of an organism that was far more abundant in the past based on our fossil record than their modern-day counterparts would lead you to believe. Some crinoids use a mucus net to aid in food capture. So that completes our introduction to lophophorates and echinoderms. Now, have you ever been really close to achieving a goal only to fall short? Our next group of organisms understands that all too well. I'll see you in the next video.